Uh, for those of you who are new, let me extend an incredibly warm welcome. I am very delighted that you are with us this morning, and my desire is that you would stay with us for a long time, that you would really feel like you've come home to your family, um, because that's really, at the end of the day, what we are. We are a family, loving and caring for one another, uh, as Jesus has loved and cared for us. Now, for many of you, of course, you're very familiar, I am not Dwayne. Uh, Pastor Dwayne and his family are out on vacation, a much-needed vacation uh, for the next couple of weeks. I'll be preaching this week and next week. Um, really, it's a time for them to really energize and reconnect and get ready for our fall launch. Uh, Pastor Dwayne will be behind the pulpit again September 4th. Um, and fall, for any church, is an incredibly important time. You guys can think of, uh, you know, the seasons of farming. I'm not a farmer. Most of you probably aren't farmers either, but that's okay. You guys know seasons, right? Unless you grew up in San Diego, and then you don't know seasons. I grew up in Phoenix. I don't know seasons either. But I hear that there are four of them, uh, and you have, <laughs> uh, yeah. In Phoenix, it's hot and hotter, so, you know, there you go. But most parts of the country, at least, experience four seasons, you know, and uh, the fall is time for harvest, um, a lot of schools will actually take certain times where all of the kids will be out of school and they'll go and they'll help with their parents' farm and doing the harvest because it is a busy time. It is a time where we really uh, harvest as much of the crops as God has given us. And for churches, we have very similar seasons. For us, as the fall uh, is a time of harvest, uh, not just harvesting souls, but just in terms of labor and a lot of things that we uh, really kind of roll out. And we have a, a few different things that we're really excited about rolling out this fall uh, that we as the leadership have been thinking about and praying about for a long time, for months. I mean, even just on this uh, Our Church Life video, we have the women's retreat coming up at the end of September. By the way, if you're a woman, go. If you're a man, let your wife go. Um, for reals, it's going to be good. We have college night that I help oversee. I don't know why we had a toga thing. We don't do toga parties, but uh, you know, youth. I mean, just so many things that are rolling out. And one of the amazing opportunities that we have is October 2nd. We are going to be multiplying this morning service into two morning services. You can clap. Honestly, guys, uh, I, I love interaction, so if you guys want to say amens or boos or hisses, <laughs> please do that. I work better interacting. But uh, anyway, so October 2nd is the Sunday that we're really gearing up for multiplying to two services. We're going to, instead of a 10 o'clock service, we're going to have a 9 o'clock and an 11 o'clock. Uh, during the summer, every, every church experiences a little bit of a low dip in terms of their kind of Sunday gathering, but come back into the fall, this place, it's already, you know, pretty full, and it's going to continue to get even more full. And we, one of our values as a church is being a church that is incredibly hospitable. We want as many people to become part of our family as possible, as many people to know Jesus and his goodness and his salvation as possible. And if new people are coming in and they can't find a seat or they feel like it's too many people here, we want to make sure we can do everything in our power to make it possible for them to be with us, to hear the gospel, to experience life in Christ. And so October 2nd, we're going to be multiplying our 10 o'clock service to 2, to 9 and 11. Many of you have been with us for many years, and we've done this before, haven't we? <laughs> we've done this before. We've gone from a 10 o'clock to multiplying into two morning services, a 9 and 11. And what happened? I mean, our church grew by like three or fourfold. It was really an incredible thing to see God do that. It's what ended up launching us here into this space now. Um, I'm excited that we get to do this. Um, now, this does provide some opportunities for service. Dare I even say some needs, you know? We have three uh, ministries that could really use more volunteers helping with this in order for us to accommodate two services. The first is the family ministry. We could use six more parents or volunteers, but especially parents, uh, to volunteer with our kids. We could use four more people for the AV department. And we could use four more people for hospitality, creating a whole other team. Now, these, I'm just kind of giving you guys a little bit of vision. Uh, if, if you're not yet serving or you're considering where do I want to serve, let me just kind of humbly suggest one of those three ministries. Uh, we want to be able to have our ministries so full so that when we actually do go to our 9 and 11 service on October 2nd, 
it'll be smooth, and it'll be a huge blessing. So, I'm excited for the fall, you guys. Um, I'm believing God for big things. We as the, the pastoral leadership team are believing God for big things. Uh, I'm convinced that he's going to do an amazing work in our lives and in the lives of the people who will become part of our family in the fall. Kind of cool, right? No. It's not. Uh, it is. So even though like, I'm super stoked for the fall, and I really am, um, I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, just kind of a moment of honesty. Um, my soul is a little bit heavy. Um, it's a little bit heavy. I know many of you in our, in our congregation, in our church family, and the last few weeks have been kind of trying, perhaps difficult in many ways. We've experienced some surprises, some letdowns. And I just want to kind of say that up front because as, as a pastor, um, I feel it with you guys. One of the joys of being a pastor is getting to be um, having our hearts expanded with love for many. Kind of like when you're a parent and you have a lot of kids, you find that your heart continues to grow in love, you know? It's like the same as being a pastor, except for I've got 250 people that I get to love. And so it's just kind of with a little bit of a heaviness that, you know, I, I understand where many of you guys are at this morning, and I just want to kind of acknowledge that and to say I'm excited to focus on the passage of Scripture that we are going to be focusing on today. I think it is an unbelievable, beautiful, God-glorifying, soul-restoring passage of Scripture and I know that many of you here will fall in love with Jesus more. That you're going to be encouraged. You might even be challenged in some ways. So with that, I'd like us to read God's word. And kind of as we've been doing, if you're able to, I know my wife is eight months pregnant, so don't stand up, Valerie. <laughs> but let's go ahead, for those of you who can, let's stand in honor of the reading of God's word. This is Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to go ahead and read it. I'll declare it as God's word. We'll thank him for it together as a church family, and then I'll pray over it. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. Even with our Sunday blessing in 1 Peter chapter 3, God, we are, uh, or chapter 1, God, we are reminded of how great and precious your promises are to us, that we might actually be partakers of the divine nature, God, that we might relate with you in the very deepest part of our soul. Jesus, that we might experience your restoration, your forgiveness. Jesus, we might really experience our truest identity found only in you. And God, this morning, as we focus on your word, as we study it, Jesus, I pray that you would speak to us by your spirit through your word. God, that every single one of us here would really see ourselves in this passage in some way. And God, honestly, that you would just be glorified in it. We thank you for your word, Father God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Guys, isn't that a beautiful passage of scripture? Isn't that awesome? You know, sometimes when we think of the Old Testament, we can think of uh, kind of the angry and wrathful aspects of God, which are certainly 
there in the Old Testament, absolutely, he pronounces judgment upon his enemies. We don't often think about the, the tenderness, the compassion that God has for his people. And, you know, verse 4, God actually says, I love you. Usually when we think of the love of God, we think of Jesus, we go to the New Testament and find instantly all these verses about God's love, right? But here they are in the Old Testament too. Literally, God says, I love you. How often have you guys longed to hear the Lord's voice in your ear to your soul saying, I love you? We're built for it. We long for it. And here it is. Really, we can look at this passage in the Old Testament as New Testament Christians because really it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. In Luke chapter 24, verse 27, Jesus is with some of his disciples and they're really confused as to what's going on. This is just after his resurrection and they don't know what to think. They don't know what to do. And Jesus appears with these disciples on the road to the city called Emmaus and he ends up sharing a meal with them and doing some Bible study with them actually. And this is what he says. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, meaning Jesus, interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. It's pretty cool. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. This is the Apostle Paul, many years later, writing about the scriptures. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. These are different ways of the New Testament authors, Luke and Paul, both describing how the Old Testament really finds its fulfillment in Christ. So we, as New Testament believers, can come to a book like Isaiah, which probably many of you haven't read, uh, and that's okay, but we can read it and see Christ in it. And we can understand where we fit in the scheme of Isaiah. There's a really good, uh, I just love this quote by this guy named Richard Schultz. Um, He says this about Isaiah, and this I think will help us as we begin to study it and kind of dissect it and take it apart. Isaiah, meaning the book of the Bible that we're in uh, this morning, is neither a dogmatic tech book nor merely an anthology of ancient religious texts. That's hard to say. Rather, it is a prophetic witness to the divine word, addressing the fears and hopes of God's people within the context of their historical situation. This is a fancy way of saying that we today can read uh, Isaiah and see ourselves in it and really see God and who we are in it. And so that is what I am going with this morning. I've titled my sermon, The Soul Restoring Intimacy of God. The Soul Restoring Intimacy of God because I'm convinced that as we experience the ravages of sin, the corruption because of sin in our lives and all of its multifaceted experiences, that the thing that will absolutely restore our souls, restore hope, restore joy, restore peace and happiness again, is communion with Christ. That is what will restore our souls, is communion with Christ. And there's three ways that I would like us to focus on as we focus through Isaiah 43, which is redeemed, rescued, it says restored, that's okay, and ransomed, redeemed, restored, rescued, insert that in your mind, and ransomed. And this is very clear from our text. Isaiah 43.1, I think we'll have it up here. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name. You are mine. Key words in here, created. Formed, redeemed, called. Notice that all of these are in the past tense, right? These are all uh, calling God's people to look back at their life. These are all past tense words describing God's relationship with his people. This isn't the very first time that God would cause his people to remember. In Joshua chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, we have Joshua, who is the one who took over leading the people of Israel after Moses passed away. They had just crossed over the River Jordan, which is like the Mississippi River, basically, but in the Middle East, you know. And this is what uh, God commanded the people through Joshua. 
And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. That's the key right there. This is God literally having his people set up stones and a little pillar so that the people would look at them and remember. That the people would look at them and remember. That they would remember the Lord. That they would remember what it is that God had brought them through. That they would remember. Here in our context of Isaiah chapter 43, God's people desperately, desperately needed to be reminded of this. Isaiah was a prophet who prophesied for 40 years to God's people during a very tumultuous time of Israel's history. At the time that he's writing Isaiah chapter 43, a large portion of the population had been taken into captivity. They were taken into slavery and oppression. Families were ripped apart. Many people were killed. Children no longer had parents, but were in a foreign and strange land. It was a very scary time for Israel's national history. And Isaiah prophesies, Isaiah 43, that God would give his people hope. That God would give them the reminder of who he is, right? But now thus says the Lord, starting with his name, and who they are. That they were God's people. He created them. He formed them. He redeemed them. He called them by name. Beautiful, isn't it? That word formed is probably the best word in this whole verse. I mean, you can't really pick one favorite word, I guess, but I like this word formed in the Hebrew because it literally has the image of a potter taking his hands and forming the clay. Okay, it's on the wheel and it's forming. Now, what has Israel lived up to this point? A lot of hardship. <laughs> lots and lots of hardship. Sin that they've done against the Lord, part of the reason why they're in captivity in the first place is because they keep rejecting the Lord. They keep worshiping these stupid idols that are not gods at all. They keep defiling the sacrifices of God. God uses this nation as a discipline for his people to remind them of who they are. So part of the reason why they're there is because of their own sin. Part of the reason why they're there is that the Lord will remind them who he is. But all of the good, all of the bad, all of the ugly that God's people had experienced up to this point, God says, I have formed you. I have formed you. And he is causing his people to be reminded. Why? Because we forget. Because they would forget. It's simple. We are caused and called to remember because we forget. We forget who God is. We forget what he's done in our life. And what happens when we forget? Doubt quickly follows on the heel of forgetfulness. Can God really save me? Can God really provide for me? Can God actually bring healing in those deep and dark and scary places of my life. Though it begins to nip at the heels of forgetfulness, it is incredibly important that we remember our story. That actually we retell our story often. Because in the retelling of our story, especially in the context of the gospel, we're reminded of who God is and what he has done. Because God never changes, friends. He never changes and he will continue to do those very same things in your life, period. It's a guarantee. It's not going to change. Now, uh, I know that I'm, I'm kind of young. I'm only 32 years old. And uh, I know for some of you that's like, wow, that's really old. <laughs> but probably for most of you, you're just like, young whippersnapper. Uh, <laughs> Um, but, but I can tell you this, I love you. 
I love you, church. I know many of your stories. Some of these stories are really difficult. You've had bad things happen to you. Some of you have done things that you wish you never did. And it causes great shame to think about it. Some of you have lived some very good lives. But the thing that I have come to love about you, my church, is that your stories are precious. The story of God's people is precious to him, for he is the one who wrote it for them. Your stories are precious. You can think of it like a prism. I know a lot about prisms. I did my sixth grade science fair project on prisms. (laughs) But you can think of your story like a prism. All of the good and the bad and the ugly, all of the things that you've experienced, all of the things that have been done to you, all of the things that you've done, everything is like the cut of a prism. You guys ever seen prisms? They look kind of like diamonds. And they're all different. It's amazing to me. They're all different. But here's the thing that makes a prism so beautiful and so cool, is that when the light hits it, at just the right angle, what happens? You get a rainbow, right? You get a rainbow of color. And this is our story. Every aspect of our story is God forming it on purpose. He is not perplexed by anything. He is not surprised by anything. Every aspect of your story is God forming it, creating a beautiful prism through which the light of his glory and the gospel can shine through. And every cut, every angle is an opportunity for the light to to bounce off it in just a, a unique way to create such a beautiful prism, a hue of rainbow color. If any of you guys have ever been to our house, we have a prism that hangs down in the front of our big front living room window. And every day, at late afternoon sun hits that prism and uh, rainbows shower the living room. It's really beautiful. And uh, when our, our daughter was kind of toddling around and learning how to walk, you know, we, it, we call it rainbow time in our house. Uh, you know, we say, hey, Felicity, it's rainbow time. And then, you know, just for fun, I'd like tap it and like it would shimmer and sparkle like we're in a disco ball hall, you know. And she would go and chase these rainbows and try to catch them. Uh, it's overwhelmingly cute. But, um, <laughs> but that is our story. Every single one of you here, everyone here, has this story. Every single one of you is this prism through which the light of God's glory and of his goodness and of the gospel can shine forth and produce a brilliant rainbow hue of color. Even all the ugly and the bad things, even those things are opportunities for God's glory to shine in a unique way that you might know the Lord in a unique way way that I won't. And as we tell our stories, as we share them with one another, guess what? As I hear those things that God has done in your life, I get to know the Lord a little bit better. I get to know him in a little bit of a different way. It's beautiful. Oftentimes we can think of like our stories starting when we come to Christ, right? It's like, well, now now my story really starts when I came to the Lord and was saved. Um, I'll let John Calvin actually tell you what that says, what that is. He says, God has redeemed us to himself before the effect of redemption reaches us. This is a really packed little quote. Because what he's saying is that at the cross, you were redeemed. 2,000 plus years ago, you were redeemed at the cross. You, sitting in this chair, San Diego, and the Resolve Church, were redeemed at the cross. For those of us who are in Christ before the effect of redemption reaches you. That is pretty heavy stuff. It's actually really encouraging stuff because you can think about our conversions as these stones of remembrance. 
We can think about all of the significant things that God has done in our life, like these stones of remembrance that Joshua commanded the people to remember the Lord. They're really more for us to be encouraged that we are his, that nothing can take us out of his hands, that we are forever safe and secure in the Father's hands. We experience intimacy at the very deepest level of our soul when we review our life story. We see how God, through all of our good, all of our bad, and all of our ugly, has been forming us and creating us in Christ by his own hands, or that word formed, by his own hands. Now, how does remembering the past, how does remembering my relationship with the Lord really actually help me with perhaps the future? That's a great question. And I'll answer that question with a story. Now, some of you know this story. Um, it's probably pretty familiar to you, but I'm going to tell it anyway. And if you know it, please don't stop me. I'm going to keep going. Uh, there was once a long, long, long time ago, these three young men, and they loved God. They loved him with all of their heart, with their lives. Their whole lives were set apart for God. But one day, much like Isaiah, they were taken into captivity. They were stolen away from their homes and the parents and the siblings that they loved and cherished so much. And they were brought to an enemy land where they were hated. They were in a godless land with a godless language and godless culture. They were taken to become slaves, actually, of a king who believed himself to be God, believed himself to be a God. These three young men, they were probably no more than older boys, actually, at this point, but in any case, they were taught the language and the cultures. They were these slaves of this godless king who hated these young boys because of who they were. So one day, this king decides to build a, a giant statue of himself, huge, tall, totally gold. The entire thing is gold. There hasn't been that much gold ever. I mean, it's just incredible. This king brings out as many of his subjects as possible to this plain outside the city and commanded the people, when you hear this music, this harsh, ugly music played, that you are to bow in worship of me. These three young boys were part of this entourage of many people out on this plane. And so these young men hear this harsh and ugly music played, and they see everyone around them bowing down to this golden statue out of fear for this godless king. These three young men had determined in their heart that they would love God, who was actually the king of heaven, that they would not bow before any king of men. And the king, of course, spots them. They're like these cedar trees in the middle of a, a plain. They're standing up. Everyone else is bound prostrate on the ground. So he angrily calls them over to himself, especially because they're in his court as his slaves. They should know better. So he addresses them. So they want to give you another chance. We'll do this again. And if you don't bow down, I'll kill you. So everyone stands up, and then the music plays, and they all bow down before this golden statue, and the three young men continue to stand. So what happens? The king calls them over and is and so enraged that he decides that he's going to execute them in a very gruesome way by being burned alive. He takes these three young men and throws them into this furnace that had been heated beyond human possibility of, of heat. I mean, the guards ended up dying because of the heat. I don't know how the men got in there, but it was so hot that the guards and themselves were killed, putting him into this fiery furnace. The king, in his gleeful rage, wants to watch them burn alive. So he looks as best he can into this fiery furnace. And he is shocked. He's perplexed and actually kind of afraid. Because not only are these three young men not being burned alive, there's not even three in there. There's four. Did I not put three men in there? Why is there four? And the fourth is like the son of God. He is fearful. And he calls out these three young men and addresses them. Not one hair on their head was singed. And there wasn't even the smell of smoke on them. 
Now, some of you are familiar with the story, right? I mean, it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You learn about this and you know, our kids with like a felt board and, and, and things like that. Uh, but really, this is the idea of what we have going into our next point of rescued. This is the imagery that we have. Isaiah 43 verse 2 says this. I don't know if it'll be up there, but I'll read it. Uh, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. This story happened in Israel's history. It really happened. This is an image of what we see here with the fire, with the water, the the floods, and all of that stuff. God's people were very well acquainted with water, weren't they? You think of Noah and the flood that covered the whole earth, and yet God spared his people in an ark. You think of, of course, the Red Sea, where God took them out of oppression and slavery and brought them on dry land, across the Red Sea. And then with Joshua 4, which we saw a few minutes ago, same kind of thing with the River Jordan. Same exact thing. God stops the water from flowing so that they pass across on dry land. God's people were very well acquainted with water. They were well acquainted with with fire. But here's the, the crazy thing about this verse, is the word when. When you walk through the rivers. When You walk through the fire. These are promises of God allowing his people to experience suffering. Oftentimes when we think about the promises of God, what do you think of? Like joy, right? The promise of salvation. The promise of provision. The promise of peace. These are promises that we love And we adore these promises. They are encouragements to our soul, and they are. But I think we often forget that God also promises his people that they will suffer. That they'll experience trial and hardship, affliction. And this is what God is doing here in Isaiah 43 too. Is he reminding them that you will experience these things. And every single one of us here is either in the midst of a trial. You are in the midst of an affliction of some kind. Perhaps you're just coming out of one and you're experiencing God's grace in your life and maybe a stability that you haven't had in your soul for a little while. Or maybe you're just going into uh, an affliction or a trial or some kind of hardship. We're all in one of these three camps. And I am encouraged that the Lord does this for us because of the promises which follow in verse two. He says this, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. The preservation of God's people and the presence of God with his people. This is what we see in this verse here. The presence of God with us. God is with you, beloved friends. God is with you now, right now. He is with you. He knows suffering. He knows pain. He's experienced it deeper and more intensely than you ever will. And it will not overwhelm you. It will not burn you. You will ultimately not be consumed by these things. You shall be preserved until the end. Now, when we apply these to our lives, we can see waters are overwhelming. We can feel like we're drowning, right? Fire is is pain. And I'm going to kind of unpack that just a little bit in these next few minutes. With overwhelming and feeling like we're drowning, how many of you guys have ever felt like you're just drowning, right? Uh, I know that I feel this often, um, and, and it's not a fun feeling, right? We can feel like we're drowning. What are some things that, that make us feel like we're, we're drowning? Emotions. Emotions can make us feel like we're drowning. You know, fear, anxiety, anger, grief, depression. Um, I, I know for me, anger is an emotion uh, that I've had to really wrestle with for my entire life. 
I'm sure some of you are surprised to hear that. But I used to have quite the temper. And I remember the story that my mom would tell me, and, and she always tells this story because it's like her favorite story of my anger, which is a weird thing to say. <laughs> but it is true. She has like my, the favorite Ryan Buss anger story uh, is when I was 16 years old. I'm the oldest of six kids. And, uh, you know, I, I needed to hit like every marker of, of a teenager so that, you know, like getting your driver's license and permit and all that kind of stuff so that my parents could say, okay, now you take charge of your siblings and drive them around everywhere. Uh, and so, you know, got my, license, or got my driver's permit on time when I was 15 and a half and started driving my siblings everywhere with my parents sitting next to me. And then uh, my parents really wanted me and were pushing for me to get my driver's license. And so, man, I like worked hard to make sure that I could drive really well. And I kind of looked at the book a little bit, studying laws and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but man, I was an excellent driver. And so comes the day of my... Uh, test, and I'm going, and I'm driving, and I get flying colors driving, and then I go to take the written portion of the test, and um, I miss a few. I failed the test. And I was pissed. <laughs> I was so angry. I was so angry at myself. I was angry at the DMV people for marking those things off. You know, I was just angry, man. I was so angry, and I saw red. You know? And so I walk out of the DMV, and my mom is in the car, and she's kind of waiting for me. And through the window, she sees me walk out, and I'm, like, crying, and I, like, you know, like, fall on my knees, and I'm, like, ripping this paper apart because I'm so angry. And my mom, I love her to death. She's amazing. Very patient with me sometimes. Uh, and, and she would, like, gathered all of the, the, the pieces of paper because I had to return it the next day to take the test again. <laughs> and so she like taped it all up and, and everything, you know, kind of like, and I brought it back with this taped up, it was a mess, but uh, yeah. Emotions can overwhelm us, right? And can make us feel like we're drowning, can make us feel like we're lost in them. And sometimes those emotions can linger. I and mean, that was an instant for me, but sometimes we have these emotions that are these underlying emotions that can last for a long, 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 long time especially anger, can really sit with us. Now, what causes pain? This would be like the fire. What causes pain? And by the way, emotion's not the only thing that overwhelms you. There's a lot of other things, but I just want to go on to this next point really fast. There's a lot of things that cause pain. I mean, we can be persecuted for our faith, absolutely. Uh, physical pain, uh, for some people, is a, is a real trial, Right, and it's a way that they experience uh, suffering. Um, I know for me, uh, words are probably the biggest way that I experience uh, fire and pain in my life. Words. Words always lead to action, which always lead to words. It's like a it's like a circle. Now, the Apostle James uh, writes this in James chapter three, verses five through ten about words, and he uses the word tongue for this. He says, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and itself set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, my sisters, these things ought not to be so. James is intense, man. Right? But you guys get the picture? The tongue is a fire. It is something that can cause deep pain and deep woundedness in your life. I myself have been the recipient of much fire through words. It was ultimately what led me to the Lord Jesus Christ when I was 16, through slanderous rumors that were spread about me in high school. Words can cause deep pain, deep wounds. But here's the thing with the tongue. It can also bring great encouragement. The next one is Proverbs 18.21. I like this a lot. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. 
death and life. So I just touch on this church because I want us to be a people who speak well to each other, who speak words of encouragement, who speak words of truth, always surrounded by love, because words have the power to bring great healing. The, what is the gospel? The gospel is a message spoken with words, which has the power to heal, has the power to change our lives for eternity. Kind of wrapping up this little second point of being rescued, you know, we, we can, we're going to experience many circumstances in our life of feeling like we're overwhelmed and like we're drowning because of circumstances that the Lord has brought us in. Our faith is going to be tested beyond our ability to hold on oftentimes. We are going to be stretched beyond our strength. And sometimes it will feel as if we're being burned on the inside. And I don't know uh, where all of you are at today. But I guarantee you, if you haven't experienced this yet, you will. And for those of us who are in it, the promise, as I mentioned before, is that God is with us. No matter how hard or how bad or how dark or how painful things can get, Jesus will ultimately deliver us. And there's nothing that anyone can say or do that will ever stop his never stopping, never giving up, always and forever love toward you. He is with you. Why does God allow us to experience these things in our lives? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. Peter says this, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. To make our faith shine like gold. To refine us so that God might be glorified. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3-5. through 5, The secondary reason. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. With what? With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Experiencing the sufferings of Christ, we're actually uh, really joined to the life of Christ. Experiencing the comfort of Christ we can actually comfort others as well. The intimacy that we have with Christ in the midst of suffering and affliction actually helps to restore our souls because it draws us close into the arms of the one for whom we were made. It's beautiful. Lastly, let's go ahead and, and focus on our last point of being ransomed. I'm going to go ahead and read verses 3 and 4 for you quickly. Isaiah 43, verses 3 and 4. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba, in exchange for you. Well, I guess I'll stop there. What is going on? You know, with the word ransomed, obviously, it's in there in verse 3. I give Egypt as your ransom. Really, this touches on the price that God would be willing to pay to bring his people back. For us, the price that God is willing to pay to bring you back, your as his son or his daughter, to him. Now, these Egypt, Cush, Seba, these are the enemies of God, right? Oftentimes, uh, prophets would use the terms, not just as a, of course, talking about the, the people then, but also as a way of describing uh, God's enemies. An attack on God's people was an attack on God himself. And so with this, we can see uh, as God delivering his people, from their enemies, but also we can be seen as how much God values his people above all other peoples. How much God values his people above all other peoples. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. This is a precious verse to me. He says this to his people. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession, out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That is awesome. Right? I mean, look at that. 
That's not because you were the, the most amount of people. You had nothing. In fact, you were the least of all the peoples. But he set his love on them. And he chose them. Why? Because he did. This is humbling for us, friends. This is humbling for us. What God is saying here is that he chose them. In the same way that, that God sets his love and favor upon Israel, we, are, our spiritual Israel, is the same way that he has set his love upon us. He set his love upon them because he chose them. And he chose them because he loved them. They brought nothing to the table. In fact, they were probably taking things off the table. Yet he chose them. And he set his love and his favor upon them. They were lovely because he loved them. And this is true for you and for me this morning. For those of us who are in Christ, he simply loves you. And he chose you. Why? Because he loves you. Why? Because he chose you. Why? Because he loves you. It's not about you. It is. But it's really about God setting his favor upon you. All right, let's take a look at the next verse. This is my favorite verse. This is like a life verse for me. Friends, if you come away with nothing other than this verse, I would be happy. This is the Lord saying, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you, I give men in return for you, peoples, in exchange for your life. Three words, precious, honored, and loved. With precious, God delights in his people. He holds them as near and dear to his heart. This is the language of a husband saying how much he loves and values his wife. Deuteronomy 7, we saw that this is how much God considers his people his treasured possession. My beloved family, you are precious to God. Next is honored. God raises us up to a position of honor in his created order. We occupy the highest seat of power next to Christ. We are called his sons and daughters, which means that we are the princes and princesses of the nobility of all of creation. And you are loved. God sets his affection upon you and calls you blessed. We are his children, loved with the love that only a parent can give their child. Some of you here today don't believe this about yourself. Some of you here today don't believe that you're actually precious. You feel like you're trash. You feel like you've done too many bad things for God to truly love you, to truly call you honored. But look at this verse. These things are not true. You are precious. You are honored. And you are loved because ultimately God would not exchange peoples for your life, for even the wealth of the the power of the greatest nations on earth could not compare to the ransom that we owed God. No, no, no. God would not exchange peoples for your life. He would exchange the one that he honored and valued more above anybody else. He would exchange his son. For you. He gave him up for you. Because of all the things that you've done in your life. Because of all the things that have been done to you in your life. God calls you precious. And sends his son to die. So that you might have life. That you might be called honored. That you might be raised up as a daughter or a son of the living God. How precious are you? How much is a thing worth? A thing is worth what you're willing to pay for it, right? That's how much it's worth. How much are you willing to pay for something is how much it is worth. How much is, are you precious to God? How much are you worth to him? His son. That's huge. You guys, our minds can't even understand 
just how precious you are, just how loved and honored by God you are. The price of his son. This truly shows the intimacy of God toward us, doesn't it? For him to be willing to give up everything in order to save you, in order to be with you, in order to preserve you to the end, to make you his precious possession, his honored and loved people. When we remember what we are worth to God, it restores my soul. Because deep down, I know that I am loved. Uh, my wife and I love Snow Patrol. And uh, our, our song that we danced to at our wedding was called Chasing Cars. Some of you are familiar with that song. And there's a line in there that is like, I, get, I love it. I'm just going to conclude with this line because I think it speaks true to the, the human condition of our soul, is that those three words are said too much and not enough. Those three words, you know the ones, are said too much and not enough. We can't get enough of the reminder of God's love for us. You ever wanted to hear God say, I love you? Boom, there it is. Isaiah 43, 4, I love you. I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we have a little bit of family business to enjoy. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your love to us. We just can't get enough of the reminder of your precious love. God, that you would enter into the most broken and dark and hard condition of the human experience, that Jesus, you would be tortured and experience trials beyond which we can even, cannot even imagine. Jesus, that you would suffer and die in exchange for our life. That Jesus, you would be raised to new life, that we who cling to you, Jesus, might be given new, eternal, everlasting, deep and fulfilling life. Jesus, thank you for how you constantly pursue us, that you formed us, that you've promised to be with us and to preserve us. And you speak to our present condition, that we are precious and honored and loved. Jesus, I pray that these truths would sink into the very fiber of our souls. And God, that we might find our delight and joy in you this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Is this on? Hi, everyone. We are the Peppins. I'm Brian. This is Kim. This is Alice. Hi, my name is David Harris. My name is Sarah. Uh, and I'm the lead of the worship team. Sarah. Arasta. Happy Sunday, church. I'm Jacob Martin. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> totally. Um, all right. So... We're going to make some covenants for you guys as the leadership of the Resolve Church. Uh, Mr. Leach, I see you back there. Uh, you want to come actually come out? Um, he's, part of, he's on staff with us. Uh, he's the executive assistant to Dwayne. So um, you're going to represent leadership as well. Thank you, Ryan. So we, the leadership of the Resolve Church, want a covenant to love you, to care for you, and continually point you to Jesus and his word as long as you are in our midst. Do you now publicly confess faith in Jesus as Savior and covenant to serve him, his people, and their children as long as Jesus has called you to be in this church? If so, say, we do. Now, to all of our current members of the church, do you covenant to help these new members of our church to love Jesus? Do you promise to care for them and serve them and their children as long as Jesus has them in our church? If so, say, we do. Awesome. All right. Ryan, you want to pray? Lord, what a glad day it is when we induct new friends to be our family. We thank you for these people who are here this morning, who have gone through what it is to learn to become members of a church and really become family, to become part of us, to become one with us in our body here at the Resolve Church in San Diego. So we thank you for these. We ask that you would bless them and help us as the church to love them well, to help raise their children, to work with them and walk with them through the good and the bad times. Lord, because this is what you do for us. This is what you do for your people. You restore us. You love us. 
You honor us. You have called us precious. And so I ask that you would help us as a family, as members of one body, belonging to you, Christ, to do that for these people. Lord, we love you. We thank you for them. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. It's appropriate to clap for them. Oh, okay. Cool. All right, guys. Thank you. Yeah.